good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? All right. So last week we started a very serious, sober-minded, bold message, a two-part series on having a bold faith. And what does that really mean for us? And we looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and three bold people who, I mean, they pulled no punches. They literally stood up when everyone else was bowing down. Today we're going to look at another illustration here, and uh, let me have my helper here. You want to come up here? Let me put this here. Put that right there. Okay. I'll tell you what. Do you feel strong? I want to hold that. Imagine this represents you, okay? A clear, empty picture. This is you. This is going to be your life, okay? This is what we all start out with. And this milk represents your life, your essence, your spirit, your mind, your body, your soul, everything right here, okay? Everybody starts with this. Can you hold a little higher? A little higher? I'm just kidding. That's good. Just like that. I know it's heavy. All right. So we're going to fill this all the way up, okay, with good, wholesome goodness fortified with vitamin D and whatever else they put in here and scary stuff. And I know it's homogenized and pasteurized and gluten-free and fat-free or whatever. This is you. This, however, oh, this heavenly divine substance represents God. As only chocolate syrup can, right? It's divine goodness. It's fortified, I'm sure, with all kinds of minerals and vitamins. I'm sure it's good for us all. So what we're going to do, here, why don't you set that down? I'm going to trade you. I'm going to let you be the pourer of this, okay? You got that? Okay, you open that up. And you just pour some right there in the middle, nice and high for all to see. Good, good, a little bit more, a little bit more. This represents God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, coming into our lives. Keep going, keep going. Don't be shy now, Nedry. Here we go. Come on, come on, a little bit more. Good, is that enough? More? All right, keep it going. Crowd wants more. You good? You got more left in there? Still got some? Good, all right. Is it starting to pool on the bottom yet? Is it? Can you see it? All right, give it another big squeeze. Just like that, awesome. Got it, good, good. Yeah, one more. Boy, yeah. Oh, now that is good. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. You can set that down. Now, the problem is a lot of us look just like this white milk all day long, not only on Sundays, but also during the week, okay? From a distance, this looks no different than any other gallon of white milk. I could even put this on a shelf, I bet, and you would walk right by it and think if this was among a dozen other white milk jugs, you would think this is normal milk. And this is true of a lot of Christians today. Now, you might see a little bit pooled here at the bottom, and, and I'm not saying people don't have Jesus in their life, but you have to look really hard to see it. In fact, you have to not only look hard, you've got to look at the right spot to see it. Maybe even on the right day, the right hour. See, we, we look like Christians today. Everybody knows we're Christians, not just because we got chocolate milk and we're here, but you know, woo, praise Jesus. But what if I covered this up? Well, now you can't tell at all. You don't know if this is white milk. You don't know if this is chocolate milk. You don't know what it's supposed to be. All you know is it looks just like everybody else. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come along and say, dude, that's not bold. You are so milk toast, vanilla white, it's pathetic. I can't tell you apart from the, the pagans. So what they do is they come and they provide this example. Grab your spoon. Oh, it's about to get good now. And they say, until you are ready to be sold out, until you are ready to say, God, I surrender all of it and be stirred up. You go for it, girl. Stir that up. I want you to watch this color change. Oh, that's some yummy goodness right there. You know you want this. See how sweet this is? This is chocolate milk. There is no mistaking that this is chocolate milk. If I set this on a store shelf amongst a dozen other white pitchers of milk, this would stand out. It would be so bold, you couldn't miss it. And that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come along, and they go, quit living this half-baked, limp wrist, phony baloney faith. When everybody says bow down, don't bow down. Live bold. Stand out. Don't be afraid to be chocolate milk. It's yummy. I'm not going to drink it, but you get the picture, okay? <laughs> this will be in the kitchen, by the way, moms and dads. We're not going to waste this. So if, you, if you're allowed to have it, kids, you're allowed to go get this. Here you go, Barrett. And you can push this card or do whatever it is we do with stuff like that. If you want to be stirred up today, if you truly want 
to give God access to every area of your life, you are in the right place. And I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 3 as we really dive deeper this weekend. Daniel chapter 3, while you pull that up, let me welcome those who are streaming with us. If you're home, it is great to have you with us. I hope you're not sick, but uh, we are glad you tuned in all along the web, and we'll put the scriptures up for you as well. Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to start this week in verse 13. Remember, up to this point, they've made the golden image. King Nebuchadnezzar has said, y'all better bow down, and everybody does. Estimated 300,000 people were there, princes, kings, governors, you name it, and they all bowed low except for three people. The three amigos stood tall, and it was real obvious, and the astrologers, the Chaldeans, saw it, and they went, oh, you, can't, you didn't bow down, I'm a telling, and they ran to tattle to the king. They couldn't wait to go and tattle on these three Hebrews who have been getting under their nerves. They, say, they go to the king and they go, King, you, you said you'd kill them. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? They didn't bow. They didn't bow. You said you said you'd kill them. What are you going to do? And King Nebuchadnezzar has no choice. And that's where he gets stirred up and he starts getting angrier and angrier the more he thinks about how they disobeyed and they didn't bow down. And that's where we pick up the story. Read along with me. Now, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you don't worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down now and worship the image I have made, very good. I love this. It's almost like he's giving them another chance, right? He's like, okay, if you're just going to do it, we'll just sweep it under the rug. This did, we'll pretend this never happened, this, this terrible event that maybe you just misunderstood. Maybe you didn't know the, maybe you didn't hear the music. Maybe you were at a striper concert the night before and you, your, your ears are still ringing and you just didn't hear the flute and the zither and the lyre. So we're going to give you another shot. And then he says, so it's good if you do that. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? See, now he's putting on the intimidation factor. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. I love this. King Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know something, your majesty. We will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the image of gold that you have set up. Wow. That is bold defiant faith. We're reading about this. They lived it. They were staring a mean, spirited king in the face, knowing he had made this decree and saying, not going to do it. I am not bowing. I know everybody else did, and I know this is not popular, but we are standing fast in our bold faith. And the king couldn't believe it. And I love it. He summons him in, and he asks him this, this three-word question. Is it true? It's almost like he didn't believe the reports. These people coming and tattling, like, hey, they didn't bow. He brings them in. Says, I, I just got to know something, Shadrach, Meshach, Benin. Is it true? Like, you don't bow down? And that is a question we are getting asked today as Christians in our society. This could be a story from today's Apex Herald where people look at us and go, is it true you really believe this stuff? You, you Christians are so simple. You're so weird, you know? I mean, like, you just, you get together and you sing and you love Jesus. And, I mean, is it true that you don't bow down after these other gods and you don't worship the idols of big houses and money and fame and try to make more of yourself? And is it true that you seriously make others first in your life? Is it true that you love Jesus and you actually want to live like him and, and be peaceable with your neighbors? I mean, is that, you're so peculiar. To which I say, yeah. It's absolutely true. I hope people think that of us. We're supposed to be called out and be a separate people. That's what the word consecrated and ordained means. It means set apart. So people can look and go, you're not white milk, you're not white milk. You're, Ooh, chocolate milk, what's this? this? This, You got something sweet in your life. I want to know what that is. And we can tell them. It's not that we have anything great. We worship the one who is great. We're not better than anyone else. We always come at this from a, a, a position of humility position of grace. One hungry person tell another hungry person where we found food. Come on, the buffet is set and it's free. It's already been paid for. And that's what King Nebuchadnezzar can't get. Is this really true? And they're asking this of us today. 
And just like 2,500 years ago, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are yelling to us, yes, it's true, yes, church, persecution's coming, yes, you're going to stand out, yes, you're going to look like a fish swimming upstream, stay with it, that's good, you're on the right path, stay bold, don't give in. In fact, we looked at first two things last week. The first thing that they would shout to us across the centuries is those three words, don't give in. Don't do it, church. It's not worth it. These guys weren't exactly low profile. When everybody was bowing down and you could just see a sea of I don't, rear ends, I don't know, up in the air, and then there's three guys standing up on the plane and everybody's bent over. And you're like, what? What is that? They weren't low profile. They couldn't hide. They didn't even bow their heads. Would we be that bold? Man, it's easy to say, yeah. Ooh, hold that thought, because just in a minute, we're going to put ourselves in this story. And they would shout to us, guys, don't give in, church. Stay with it. It's not worth compromising your principles. It, don't do it. The next thing they shouted to us was, don't give up. Don't give up. Please, church, hang in there. You know, I look at Babylon, and I think just how they fancy themselves as enlightened and pluralistic and everybody it's, it's, it's a big group everybody come in everybody's welcome and we'll tolerate everybody's faith claims they're all equal and Jesus shows up and he says no they're not no they're not I'm the way I'm the truth no one else died for you no one else was sinless no one else was perfect I'm the way to the father there is no other way and he's saying guys don't don't give up don't be like the Babylonians the reality is God's word has not changed it's the culture around us that has crumbled. It's the culture that's changed. You're not intolerant. You will see as the days go that more and more people in this world system will become increasingly intolerant of this book and the God of this book and thereby followers of the God of this book. But here's the news. Jesus said, it's okay. It's gonna happen. Stay bold. Do not hear me. Do not cow down to that kind of pressure. You didn't bow to peer pressure. You're not going to be intimidated by fear pressure. Don't give up. Don't give in. And the last thing they would say to us today, which is so important, is don't give out. This is where the rubber hits the road. And I've talked with so many people, and so many people today are in this boat. They are in the furnace, and they are about to faint. And I get it. If you haven't been there, your time's coming. Because James tells us we all got problems. Every one of us will face ups and downs. And these three are saying, guys, you need to stand strong. You need to stay bold. I know your strength is, is ebbing. You need to not give out. Don't let your convictions fade. You see, once these three friends made this incredible stance to not give in, the part we forget about is it was them that initiated the consequences. They had to own the consequences of standing bold. Are we? Are we willing to own that? They stood bold. They knew, they knew the minute that they did this, it was highly likely the king would make good on his promise. It is highly likely that they would be bound up, the equivalent today of modern-day handcuffs. They'd be bound up and marched to the furnace. And they were about to be thrown into what they knew was a very certain and a very painful way to die. Now think about this. They're marched right up here. So let me ask a very powerful and poignant question for us today. Don't answer it out loud. Could God have kept these faithful men completely away from the fiery furnace? Could he? Could God? Absolutely. Could God, he's God. He could do anything he chooses. Whatever his pleasure is, it happens. He has but to think it, and it is literally accomplished. Could God have kept them from the fiery furnace completely? Yes. But if he did we probably wouldn't be talking about it 2,500 years later. No one writes big books about the near car wreck they almost had. It's always about driving down the road and you see this huge, horrific wreck and you, everybody slows down and what do they do? They rubberneck, right? I hope they're okay. Let me back up and see. Oh my goodness, that looks terrible. Hey, did you see it? Get a picture of that. I mean, that's, we write books and we go to the newscast about things that happened, not things that almost happened. God could have definitely delivered them. But here's the deal. Deliverance from the fiery furnace is not nearly as significant as deliverance in the fiery furnace. Think about that. They were in the flames. 
standing there with fire up all around them. Y'all, this fiery furnace was not like, just like, ooh, it's kind of hot, let's roast marshmallows. It was so incredibly huge and hot. If you read details, you'll see that the men, the soldiers, who the king said, throw those three wascally wabbits in there, the ones that threw them in died. The flames were so hot, it burned the soldiers up. It killed them. That's hot. That's crazy. And they're standing there with their hands tied, and they're about to be pushed into this huge fiery pit. And they knew, and God knew, 2,500 years later, we wouldn't be talking about, oh, you remember that time we almost died? But they were in the flames. They were stuck right in the... Now imagine the testimony they had after that. Imagine the glory that was given to God when he delivers them from that, instead of just circumventing it all around and going, hey, that could have been bad. Think about that. We're talking about it 2,500 years later because there were lessons learned in that pit, in that fiery furnace. Sometimes God does choose to remove us from the furnace, but a lot of times it's his saving that happens in the furnace, when you're in the heat, when you are in the fight of your life, when things are going horrible, when you get that diagnosis from the doctor and it's cancer, when you get those bills that can't be paid and you are looking at bankruptcy, when you are looking for that family member in that marriage and they haven't come home and it is on the rocks and it is hanging on by a thread, you're in the fiery furnace. And God is there with us. Remember, we all love the mountaintops. We all love, I'd love it if life was this, with these peaks. And we just went from peak to peak to peak. The hills are alive. And we're just dancing on the mountaintops, but that's not real life. Mountaintops are awesome, but that's not where the fruit is grown, right? The fruit is grown in the valleys. That's where the real rubber hits the road. And that's where the lost world is watching us, when our faith is tested, to see if what we say matches what we do, to see if we are bold, to see if we are the real, legit thing. These three men had such confidence in God that they were allowed to experience this truth firsthand. They knew they were safer in the furnace than they were standing in front of a king, standing there in air conditioning with them fanning them with palms and everybody's eating grapes or whatever, and in safety of the king. They knew they were safer, not there, but in a fiery pit. How weird are these people? What bold faith is this? This is incredible. I want to be like that. Life has been tough for some of us. It make no ma- I, have, I have been with you. I have cried with you. I've been in your houses, and I have shared pain with some of you that are going through it. And some of you, I mean, I'll, I'll just be honest. I don't know how you're still standing other than your faith in God. It has been wave after wave. At, like someone won't turn off the stinking wave machine at Great Wolf Lodge. And you can't quite, you get up and, and another one comes. You get up and you're like, and, I mean, it's up in your nose and it's stinging. And you, you know what I'm talking about? You ever lose your balance and are out on the beach and the salt water and it starts hurting and your eyes are blood? That's how some of us are. And that wave after wave in the furnace comes, and yet these three show up and go, it's it's bad, but listen, guys, don't give out. Not yet. Hang in a little longer because your deliverance could be just around the corner. And maybe somebody today just needed to hear that. Your deliverance could be just around. Look at their example. Let's be honest. There's a problem we have with this story. You know what it is? We know how it ends. And it dilutes the story. We look back at this and we view this entire story in light of the fact that we know there's a miraculous deliverance coming. We know it. We're like, hey, tell me about Shadrach. Oh, yeah, yeah, the story. They get thrown in the fire and they get out and it's great. Their clothes weren't sins. They didn't even smell like smoke. They still had their hair. Nobody was bald. It was a great time. And, And we look at it like that and we think, huh, yeah, that's a good story. Oh, no. No, no, back up. That's not what they experienced. You ready for a road trip? Go back with them. They had no knowledge of deliverance that was coming. They knew it could happen, but then they knew it may not because they even said their own words. But even if he doesn't, (laughs) we'll never bow to you. Do your worst, King Nebuchadnezzar. And they go, remember, there was no advance warning for them. There was no angel that showed up and quietly said, hey, guys, it's going to be kind of warm in there, but I, I, I came from the high courts of heaven, and I just want to give you a little sneak peek. Nothing's going to happen. You're going to be delivered from this. It's going to, okay, so in you go. Nothing like that. We see it because we look back in hindsight 2020 and know how it ended. They didn't know that as far as they knew. They were standing there looking at people and soldiers dying around them because it's so hot and they're about to be thrown in. Human fear had to be making their heart pump just a wee bit. Now, let me ask the question that's just hanging in the air. 
Let's put ourselves in this position. Do not answer this out loud. Would you be willing to be marched into the furnace? If that's what God had for you, take a moment, ask yourself, if everybody was bowing, if it was illegal to stand for Jesus, and the penalty was this, would you be willing to go into the furnace? You all know, that is where people experience the presence of Christ. Think about this. How many people were thrown into the furnace? King Nebuchadnezzar comes up and he looks in and doesn't see three. He sees four in there. One whose image was like the Son of God, something glorious in there, dancing around in the flames with him, almost talking, having a good time. I mean, it's, it's crazy the way they phrase this. But how many people come out of the furnace? Three. Three plus one in the fire come out. Three. Don't miss that colossal hidden diamond right there. That tells us when we are in the fires, he is there with us. Never forget that. You feel alone, but you're not. The enemy wants you to feel like you are the only one going through this. You are the only one dealing with marital problems. You're the only one on the planet struggling financially. It's just you. You're the only one whose family's falling apart and just got a bad health diagnosis. You're the only one. You're so unique. No, that's isolation, and that comes from the devil. You are not alone, and Jesus is there with us. This is incredible. This is such a bold statement of faith. I love what happens next. How does the story end? Upon seeing the faith of these three, and upon the king seeing the deliverance, even though he tried to kill them, here's what the king himself declares next. He says this, there is no other God who can deliver like this. The one who just minutes ago said, what God can deliver you from my hand, now says there is no other God who can deliver. Does anybody miss the sweet irony of this? The king who wanted people to bow down minutes ago now bows down himself to the king of kings, to the Lord of lords. Want to talk about an incredible, that's because of their testimony. They were called to live bold faith, and so are we. We're it. We're the ambassadors for Christ. We're the ones left carrying this message. And so these three are yelling us, guys, don't give up, don't give in, don't give out. In the face of a culture that's crumbling, stay strong. Now, I want to leave you with some more good news here because we touched on it just a little bit, but we're going to go deeper. Last week, you remember, I told you about Jesus' words of warning what was coming. And he said this. You can read it with me together. John 15, he says, If the world hates you, remember, it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. I love it, but you don't. You are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So guess what? It hates you. And that's a good thing because you must resemble him. Oh, to resemble him enough that people equate me with Jesus. Don't you want people to be able to say that of you? Then Jesus goes on. He says something else. In the Sermon on the Mount, one of his most famous sermons of all time, he sends this word of encouragement to you. He says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all kinds of evil things against you. Why? Because you're my followers. Be happy about it. Wait, what? Be happy about it. In fact, be very happy. Be glad for great reward awaits you in heaven. And I'm just like, oh, there's a reward for standing up for you, Lord? Seriously? And then I love this. It's almost like I always see him walking away like I left you with the truth. Oh, there is one more thing. I love this. It's like a, lean in, like, like a football huddle. Lean in. Guys, y'all remember those great prophets, Moses and, 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 and Jeremiah and all, all, even the patriarchs. Go back to Abraham. Remember, they were persecuted too. So if they persecuted them, they're going to persecute you. They should because I hope you resemble them. And I love it. It's almost like an aside, like, don't worry, you're in good company. This is incredible. Jesus is saying when you live a bold faith life that's not ashamed of him, you can expect people to notice. You can expect persecution. Hear me. The darkness will not applaud your light. Man, that's good. That's not even one of your notes. You should write that down. The darkness will not applaud your light. Nobody likes their deeds to be exposed. Before I came to Christ, I didn't. You ever walk into a filthy, dirty kitchen or like a hotel or a cabin in the woods 
and you turn on the light and there's roaches everywhere? When you turn on the light, do the roaches look up and go, yes, light, yippee! And do they stand there and look at you? What do they do? They scurry. They hate it. They hate the light. That's what it's like. When we're in sin and, we, and, and, and the, the love of God comes and His holiness and His purity pierce our heart, we're like, whoa, it's me. I am undone. Don't even look at me. Forgive me. I am so sorry. That's what it's like. The darkness does not applaud light. Oh, Christians are making me feel so good. Yay! So ha- no, we're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. When you walk in a room, you're supposed to be different. Unless you're in a room full of believers. This is such a powerful challenge for us. Jesus is saying, guys, when you're persecuting this life, take heart. Not only will you have purpose and joy in this life, but you will stand with him in glory and you will receive an additional reward. I love what J.C. McCauley wrote. This is incredible. What a perspective. He says this. Here's his quote. We are in good company in enduring the world's hatred. If the world had nothing better than a cross for Jesus, it will not have a royal carriage for his followers. What a beautiful, if if he had to carry the cross, if that was his mode, don't expect a gold-plated, gilded limousine to carry us on the journey if they did that to the one who was perfect. That is incredible. And so Nebuchadnezzar shows up and he asks these three words. I love it. Is it true? The world is asking us the very same question. They're asking this today. People are watching. They won't ask it out loud. They're looking at you and they're looking at me. And they're looking at, at what we say, and is it, does it match what we do? And oftentimes, they'll find the answer when we're being tested, when we're in the furnace, when we're in the flames, when life seems like it's spinning out of control, and you're hanging on by your fingernails, and everything seems to be coming against you. That's where the rubber meets the road. What kind of faith do they see then? Don't stand alone. You run to the place that can help you. You run to the friends that lift you up, that link arms with you. These three didn't stand alone. They had three of them. You don't think they took strength from that? You don't think their spines were stiffened by being able to join arms and stand together in that? We are being watched by a world. Those of us who are called by his name are being watched. Whether you like it or not, they're watching how you look, how you act, how you behave. They're watching your social media posts. I'm just going to leave that there. They're watching that. They're watching. I mean, think about that. Is what we say. Are we consistent? Until we, our generation, okay, you and I, all right, just speaking very frankly here, until we grasp the seriousness of the moment and the lostness of this generation, until we, until we realize that weekend Christianity is no longer going to cut it, we will continue to lose this battle. 70% of the country no longer is in church. 70%. Just a few years ago, it was 40. 40% that was coming. And even 50%. Now think about it, y'all. The falling away that was predicted is happening. It is happening all over the world. But there is such a revival and an outpouring of God's Spirit on those who remain faithful. You are going to see this chasm grow. You are going to see salt and light and darkness like never before with such clarity. Jesus said it was going to happen. But here's the deal, y'all. This lostness, this this generational lostness that we're experiencing is happening on our watch. We're the ones in the driver's seat now. And until we own that and we get serious about living a bold life, don't expect any change. This is such an exciting time for us because when we live for Christ now, our light shines brighter in the darkness than it ever has before. There is such a chance for you and I to stand as a clear contrast to what we see around us in the culture, like never before. It's incredible. So don't be discouraged about it. Be encouraged to link arms and to join and to say, I'm going to live a bold life. In fact, here's my challenge for you as you go this week. When the fires come, and they will, when you're standing in the furnace, when the fires come, stand firm. Be bold. Be bolder than you've ever been. Lean on him. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were facing real fires, not spiritual fires, real fires. And they stood firm. They didn't give in. They didn't give up. They stayed strong. Y'all remember the Olympic athlete Shun Fujimoto. I shared this a couple years ago. It's a beautiful story. This Olympian who everybody was, was, his eyes were trained on him. He made it to the Summer Olympics. 26 years old. This was his last chance to finally win gold. And this guy was on the fast track. And as he competed for his second 
to last event. He was doing the floor exercises. You know how they do those things? They do the tumble and they spin and they do, and it's like freakishly defying gravity and doing all this. Everything was going awesome until he did one flip too many and he landed and he shattered his right knee. And it was over. And as they carted him off, he sat there crying and they knew he was done and this was his last chance. He was aging out of these Olympics. And he said, no. No what? I'm not done. I did not train my entire life for this moment to be carted off. I will fight through the pain. And they let him go to the last event. You know what the last event was? It was even worse than the tumbling. The most grueling one the men can go through. It was this one right here. The rings. And that is Shun Fujimoto. The crowd was so, this arena, you could hear a pin drop. And it wasn't because Shun was doing an awesome job, because he was. And it wasn't because he was doing flips and coming and torquing his shoulders in incredible ways, and they were just, gra- and then he did the Iron Cross, and he's sitting there suspended in agony. It wasn't because of that and how awesome that was. It was because they knew exactly what you're thinking. One word, the dismount. They knew it was coming, and no one wanted to see what was about to happen. And as he wound up and got his momentum going doing it, it was like time stopped. And as he tumbled through the air, everybody held their breath to watch him land. And he nailed the landing. Inexplicably, he stood there, tears streaming down his face in absolute agony, and the crowd erupted. A few weeks later, he's being interviewed. Major reporters, Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, everybody comes. And they said, we just got to know the simple question. Did it hurt? And that was his response, too. Did it hurt? Yes. Yes, it hurt. Yes, it was hard. But here's the deal. Now I have a gold medal. And the pain I went through is long gone. I don't even feel it. Put in biblical terms that you might remember. Now I have received the prize. And those momentary trials, those tough trials that I went through, are nothing compared to the glory I see now. Those trials were tough. They were real. We're not making fun of them. We're not making light of them. But they were nothing in the grand scheme of things. And no one could take that away from him. He endured it. We could learn so much from that church to stand firm, to stand bold, to say, you know what? Yeah, it hurts. Yeah, this valley, I don't like it. Yeah, these flames are licking my feet, and I feel it, and it's hot. I got a little bit of sweat going, and I'm waiting for your deliverance, God, but we stood firm. This is incredible. Even when it's tough, even when it hurts, hang in there, church. You are the salt of the world. God is using you. Don't give up. Stay in the fight. Be bold. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for the challenging word that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the great example that they provide for us. Thank you that your word is alive and you speak to us just as real as if we were standing back and watching the flames themselves. Lord, I pray that you would give us boldness. I pray that if there's something in our life that is keeping us from living a bold, faith-filled life, Lord, we would surrender it to you today. God, we give you permission. We surrender from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, Lord. We give you access to every area. Come sweep us clean. Holy Spirit, fill us. Allow us to live bold, faith-filled lives that you are pleased with. When we stand before you, may we hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Thank you, Lord, for this awesome hour. Thank you for being with us. You are here. We pray in your powerful name, Lord. Amen. torn between myself and your truth.